As you're taking your Bibles and turning back to that passage we read just a few moments ago in Daniel chapter 9, which is our key text for today, let me say one more thing about this little insert that is in your bulletin today, the case for Christ. That's next Sunday evening, Resurrection Sunday, as a special outreach, which means if we're going to have an outreach, we need to reach out. So I encourage you and I beg you, take the insert that you have in your bulletin and this week, hand it to a friend and personally invite them to come. We all need to be involved in reaching the lost for Christ or believers who have questions. If you look on the back of that little sheet, there are like 20 questions there that people, even some Christians, sometimes, you know, question about the Bible or about Jesus or about the resurrection. And this film is specifically designed to reach people for Christ and to answer questions that Christians who are shaky in their faith may have. Lee Strobel was a, an investigative reporter, uh, well-skilled in legal methods, who started out not believing in the resurrection and sort of set out to prove it didn't happen. And after careful investigation, using all of his research and investigative tools, came to the firm conclusion that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, and Jesus Christ rose from the dead. This answers questions that people that you run into every day have. So take one and give it to someone else. For those of you who have a place where you can put it on a bulletin board, there are extra copies right outside on the little table right outside this door. Take an extra copy and post it on a bulletin board someplace. It has all the information, and we encourage you not only to post it, but to personally bring another friend. So now, please, take your Bibles, turn back over there to the book of Daniel, which is where we are looking today. And as I said, you probably are wondering, why in the world would I be talking about the book of Daniel on Palm Sunday? Well, because you may not realize it, but the Lord Jesus Christ, right before the Passion Week, gave what is called the Olivet Discourse. And he quotes this passage out of the book of Daniel because he's about to present himself as the Messianic King to Israel. I'll just read you two of the passages, a few verses from them. We have the Olivet Discourse over in Matthew chapter 24, Jesus on the Mount of Olives talking to his disciples. And Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. For a nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. All these are the beginnings of sorrows. Then shall they deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And then shall many be offended, and shall betray one another, and shall hate one another. And many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. We've already talked about the loss of love with the church at Ephesus over in the book of Revelation. But he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness to all nations. And then shall the end come. Look at verse 15. This is what we have just read. When ye therefore shall see the abomination, abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. We have that Olivet Discourse recorded over in Mark also, and I'll just read you the one verse. Mark chapter 13, it runs from verse 5 all the way down to the end of the chapter. But verse 14 says, But when ye see, shall see the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet, Standing where it ought not, let him that readeth understand. Then let them be that in Judea flee to the mountains. 
Well, you have it twice recorded in the context of the what we call Palm Sunday entrance of Jesus into Jerusalem. And yet he's giving a warning and he's pointing us back to a specific prophecy in the book of Daniel. Now, over the past six years, I've preached Palm Sunday messages on the foal of an ass, the children sang, that's the Psalms related to the triumphal entry. Why a donkey, not a horse? The 2015, the two comings of Christ to Jerusalem. 2016, fig branches, palm trees, and whips. Last year, king or rebel, the question of authority. But all of those are background to what we want to study today. One of the most incredible prophecies of the Old Testament given by Daniel the prophet that relates both to Palm Sunday and, in the future, to the coming of the Millennial Kingdom. First, let me remind you of the passage describing what's been called the triumphal entry. It came to pass when he was come nigh to Bethphage in Bethany at the mount called the Mount of Olives. So we're starting out at the Mount of Olives. We're going to see that we end at the Mount of Olives also saying, and he tells them to go get the little cold. And then verse 37, and when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, he's heading toward Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives. We're going to see that again in the future. The whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had say, now, and they quote the right psalm. They quote Psalm 118. We've preached on that in the past. Look, they call him, not blessed be the Savior, blessed be the King. Here's the offering of the King to Israel. The King that cometh in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven and glory in the highest, going all the way back to his birth. Same thing the angel said. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. Now listen to verses 41 and 42, because these verses, as he's descending the Mount of Olives to enter Jerusalem, tie us back to the prophecy in Daniel, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, he's weeping over the city, even thou, at least in this thy day, something very special about this day for Jerusalem the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemies shall cast a trench about thee, and compass thee about, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. And he tells the reason. It ties us back to verse 42. Here's the reason that it's going to happen. Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Because you didn't understand what today was all about. Wow. That's in the context of the triumphal entry. And in that context, we find two major Old Testament prophecies. We usually focus on the one from Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. But the New Testament makes reference to a second major prophecy at the triumphal entry. That's that prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. We read it just a few minutes ago. Do you remember what Jesus said? When he was come near, he beheld the city and wept over it. That's Luke 19. Now, I read you the ones out of Matthew. I read you the one out of Mark. Here we have Luke. He wept over it, saying, If thou hadst known, even thou, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes, and then verse 44, because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. Jesus wept over the city, and he says here that the specific timing of the triumphal entry fulfilled a prophecy which he called this thy day. And he wept because they knew not the time of their visitation. In other words, this specific day had been prophesied, and Jerusalem should have been able to figure it out, but because they didn't know their Old Testament scriptures, they didn't know the time of visitation. 
because they didn't understand the specific prophecy related to the triumphal entry to which Christ was referring, they were going to come under judgment and the city would be destroyed, which is what Jesus talks about in that passage. The passage also implies that this is a judgmental blindness for rejecting the messianic miracles that Jesus had done during his earthly ministry, thus proving his qualifications to be the Messiah. Remember what the text said? It said, but now are they hid from thine eyes. It's not now thine eyes are turned away. They are hid. God hid them. Judgmental blindness. Both Zechariah 9.9 9 and the prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 through 27 have a specific connection. The triumphal entry into Jerusalem was Messiah's offer of the kingdom to Israel as prophesied in many places in the Old Testament. The king making his entry to establish his kingdom. The teaching that Jesus gave in the immediate context of the triumphal entry was of a nobleman going to a far country to receive a kingdom and then returning to rule. The crowd seemed enthusiastic. They quoted the right scripture. We read it just a moment ago. Psalm 118, verses 25 and 26. But understanding, but under the leadership of the Sanhedrin, they rejected him and called for his crucifixion just a few days later. But notice something. Jesus said that they should have known the very day. This, thy day. The very day that this would occur. It was given by God as an absolute proof that Jesus and nobody else, because nobody else rode into the city of Jerusalem on that day. Nobody else could fulfill the prophecy that's given in Daniel chapter 9 if it didn't occur on that specific day. There's no other that could fulfill the claim of Messianic King. The exact time period had been prophesied in the Old Testament to determine the exact day that the triumphal entry would occur. Now, before we begin to look at what we need to understand in that prophecy, we also need to understand some basic principles of all Old Testament prophecy. Many times you have what's called a two-part or a three-part prophecy. Standing in the Old Testament, the prophets did not see the chronological difference between the first and second comings of the Messiah. Standing at a distance from those things, hundreds of years before them, they were given revelation concerning both events. But standing at that distance, they saw two majestic mountain peaks that looked like they were side by side, but they could not see the valley between these two peaks. Thus, many prophecies in the Old Testament go straight from details about the first coming of Christ and immediately start talking about details concerning the second coming of Christ. You say, oh, give me an example. Okay, you're very familiar with many of the passages. For example, all of you know Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. How many know this passage? Yeah, okay, you all know that, okay? All right, so we're on familiar ground. Here we go. Unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. That relates to the first coming. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. That relates to the second coming. And then before we get to verse 7, which also relates to the second coming, in the middle, there's a statement about his character. His name should be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Then verse 7 goes back to the second coming. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. He's going to sit on the throne of his father, David. This hasn't happened yet. That's second coming. So we have prophecy concerning his first coming, prophecy concerning his second coming, description of his character, more prophecy concerning his second coming. We see that same kind of first and second coming together even in the passage in Zechariah chapter 9, which we all remember in relation to Palm Sunday. In verses 9 and 10, where we read, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion, shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just in having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt the fold of an ass. That's the first coming. Verse 10. And I will cut off the chariot from Ephraim, and the horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off. And he shall speak peace unto the heathen, and his dominion shall be from sea even to sea, and from the river even unto the ends of the earth. That's second coming. One verse stacked on top of the other verse. Jesus himself clearly used this principle when preaching from the Old Testament in relation to Bible prophecy. Were you aware that Jesus preached from the Old Testament and he preached about prophecy? 
Did you know that he preached that way? Uh, he actually expounded some of the prophecies of the Old Testament. I, I'm sure you remember what he said in Luke chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 15. And he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, as his custom was. And he went into the synagogue. This is Luke 4, verses 15 through 21. As his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. That's Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. He chose the text that day. Listen to what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Look at verse 20. And he closed the book and gave it again to the minister and sat down and the eyes of all that were in the synagogue were fastened on him and he began to say unto them this day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears now notice three things about this number one he read a specific messianic prophecy from Isaiah number two he stated this specific messianic prophecy was fulfilled that very day. Number three, did you know that he stopped reading in the middle of Isaiah 61 2? Because the second half of the verse talks about the second coming of the Messiah. Let me read you the whole passage from Isaiah. Notice where he stops and notice what follows immediately. Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. That's all first coming. Look at the very next phrase, only separated in English by a comma. And the day of vengeance of our God. That's the second coming he jams them together and then to comfort all that mourn first coming but Jesus stopped before he read the day of the vengeance of our God which is part of the Hebrew text Jesus stopped reading after the phrase to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and he sat down because the first coming has nothing to do with the day of vengeance of our God much of Old Testament prophecy is written this way looking from a distance at the first and second coming of Christ side by side and not seeing the valley between the two mountains, which is the mystery of the church age, which was not revealed until the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Peter also implies this double mountain peak when he writes in 1 Peter 1, 11, starting in verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently. So he's talking about Old Testament prophets. They wrote it. They understood salvation was coming. They inquired, they searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Now look at verse 11. Here's what the prophets were doing. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Now the sufferings of Christ relate to the first coming. The glory that should follow relates to the second coming. Peter's talking about how the Old Testament prophets prophesied certain things that they didn't understand. They understood the correct order of Christ's coming, suffering before glory, but they didn't understand the timing searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify. Now, why is it that I've taken some pains to uh, make this point? The reason, because that prophecy we just read in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, <clears throat> also has a specific gap, if you will, between the triumphal entry where Jesus offered the kingdom to Israel on Palm Sunday and the appearance of the Antichrist which you'll see in the end of that passage, to establish his false kingdom in that very same passage in Daniel. 
In fact, there's a gap of over 2,000 years. Listen carefully as I read the key verses from Daniel again. Two princes are in view. There are two different people in view here. One's called Messiah the Prince, and the other is called the Prince that shall come. Beginning in verse 24. Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem, we have a specific starting point for this prophecy, unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The city shall, that's 69 weeks, the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off. Now, nobody has any questions about what that's talking about. That's the death of Christ. But it's after the three score and two weeks. But not for himself and the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary and the end thereof shall be with the flood. Unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. And he, nearest antecedent, is the prince that shall come, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week and in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abomination he shall make it desolate, even unto the consummation, and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Now that's what Jesus is quoting in the Olivet Discourse. We read it out of two different Gospels, out of Matthew and out of Mark. He says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it ought not, in the temple, in the sanctuary, then you've got to run for it. Now, there are several specific items that we have to notice out of this text here. First, the prophecy of the 70 weeks, so-called, in Daniel chapter 9, relates to national Israel, not to the church. How do we know that? Oh, there are a lot of indicators. Number one, Gabriel told Daniel the prophet prophecy relates to thy people. And Daniel's been in the process of praying and confessing his sins and the sins of his people, Israel. And it says so specifically in the text. It also relates to the holy city. That is, it relates to Jerusalem. That's the only place that's called the holy city in the Bible. In particular, it relates to the temple in Jerusalem because it talks about the sanctuary. That's the temple. And that prophecy also talks about the sacrifice of the temple. It says that the Antichrist is going to cause the sacrifices and the oblations to cease. It wasn't Jesus causing those t things to cease in the middle of a week. So that's clearly and strictly a Jewish context, not a church context. The church is not in view in that prophecy in Daniel 9. Second, it is not the prince that shall come who will destroy the city and the sanctuary. It says the people of the prince that shall come. In other words, the Romans. Because in 70 AD, Roman legions under General Titus destroyed the city and the sanctuary. But Titus was not the prince that shall come because John states in the book of Revelation, which was written in 96 AD, that's 26 years after the Romans destroyed Jerusalem. John writes that the Daniel events are still future. We'll see that when we get to Revelation chapter 13. In other words, the future events of Daniel 9 were not fulfilled in 70 AD. That is to say, the prince that shall come will rise out of the area of the ancient Roman Empire. Now, the Lord willing, we'll study that in a lot of depth. I hope you come on Sunday evenings when we get to Daniel, uh, Revelation chapter 13. But today, I only want to cover the prophecy in relation to Palm Sunday. Third, the word translated weeks here is the word Shavuah, which is the literal word for seven. So a literal translation of that phrase in verse 24 would be, 70 sevens are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. So the question becomes, what does the word Shavuah, seven, refer to? Seven minutes, seven hours, seven days, seven weeks, seven years, seven decades. You'll notice weeks is in italics because it's not in the original text. Uh, seven what's? As in all normal Bible interpretation, the first place to look is the immediate context. And I tell you, we're not disappointed because the context gives a very clear and specific indication of what kind of sevens are meant. Here are the indicators in the context. Number one, immediately before this, Daniel's been thinking and praying in terms of years. Daniel chapter 9, verse 1 and 2. 
In the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the seed of the Medes, which was made king over the realms of the Chaldeans, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of the years whereof the word of the Lord came unto Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. That's point number one. Daniel's thinking and praying in terms of years. Number two. These number of years were a multiple of seven. Interesting. A multiple of seven. That's the number of completion in the scripture. Just like the 77s, Gabriel mentions a few verses later in verse 24. Number three. According to Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, Daniel was studying the prophecy of Jeremiah. And we find that prophecy about the 70 years in two different places in the book of Jeremiah. We find it in Jeremiah chapter 25, verses 11 through 14, and Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 10 and 11. Remember, it says down here in Daniel chapter 9, verse 2, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by books the number of years whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. Now let me read you exactly what the prophecy says in Jeremiah. First, Jeremiah chapter 25, beginning in verse 11, and then we'll look at chapter 29. Here's Jeremiah 25, 11. And this whole land shall be a desolation and an astonishment, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. And it shall come to pass when 70 years are accomplished that I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, saith the Lord, for their iniquity and the land of the Chaldeans and will make it perpetual desolations. And I will bring upon the land all my words which I have pronounced against it, even all that is written in this book, which Jeremiah hath prophesied against all nations. Down to chapter 29, verse 10. For thus saith the Lord, that after 70 years be accomplished at Babylon, I will visit you and will perform my good word toward you in causing you to return to this place. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Now, since Jeremiah is quite obviously dealing with prophetic years, we need to know how a prophetic year is defined in the Bible. Prophetic years are clearly defined in Scripture as years composed of 360 days, or in other words, 12 months of 30 days each. It's not like our calendar. We bop all over the place. 30 days, 31 days, sometimes 28 in February, sometimes 29 in leap years. You know, we float all over the place. <laughs> Jews solve that problem by always having 30-day months and every so often adding uh, a 13th month. 30-day months. So do we have anything in the Bible that tells us this? Well, there are multiple lines of evidence for a divinely given year of 360 days. First, the record of Noah's flood says the flood began on the 17th day of the second month that's Genesis 7, 11. And it ended on the 17th day of the seventh month. Genesis 8, 4. That's exactly five months. And we have more than that. The text tells us that the period was exactly 150 days. In other words, five times 30. That's Genesis chapter 7, verse 24, and chapter 8, verse 3. Therefore, a full 12 months of 30 days each is 360 days. Second, Here's the second reason for this prophetic year, as you're trying to understand and see where it is in the Bible. Parallel prophetic passages to Daniel 9 tell us that the great tribulation period under the Antichrist is divided into two halves of three and a half years. Each of these halves is 42 months long. And the total days are also stated as to how long those 42 months are. They're stated to be 1,260 days. We'll see this in a lot more detail when we get to Revelation. I'm just giving you summaries here. So you divide that number by 42 months and you get uh, 42 months of 30 days each. And hope we'll see a lot more on Sunday evenings. You all got to come Sunday evenings. That's a quick summary of how to show how God applies identical principles for future prophecies to how he applied it to past prophecies. Third, God gave a divine calendar of years to Israel as well as a seven-day week based on the creation week with day seven being the day of rest. The calendar of years was also divided into units of seven. For example, Jews were told to sow and reap the land for six years, but then they were to let the land lie fallow in the seventh year. That's Leviticus 25, verses 3 and 4. After that seven-year cycle, it occurred seven times, so seven times seven, that's 49 years. 
Israel was supposed to proclaim a year of jubilee in the 50th year. In the 50th year, all slaves were to be set free, indebted land returned to the original owners in the original tribal divisions, and all debts were rescinded. So the calendar of years. We see a bunch of these things that being tied together in Daniel. I'll show you in just a second. Fourth, when Daniel was reading Jeremiah and praying, he was well aware that the reason God judged Israel with a precise 70-year captivity was because, we'll see this in a second, he understood that the reason it was a 70-year-long captivity was because Israel had violated the seven-year rest cycle for the, of the land for 490 years, which is exactly 77ths of years. That's specifically stated in 2 Chronicles 36, 21. Let me read you uh, verses 17 through 21. Therefore he, God, brought, them upon the king, brought upon them the king of the Chaldeans, who slew their young men with a sword in the house of their sanctuary, he had no compassion upon the young man or maiden, old man or him that stooped for age, he gave them all into his hand. And all the vessels of the house of God, great and small, and the treasures of the house of the Lord, and the treasures of the king and his of his princes, all these brought he to Babylon. So there's the beginning of the Babylonian captivity. And they burnt the house of God, and break down the walls of Jerusalem, burnt all the palaces thereof with fire, destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof, and them that had escaped from the sword carried he away to Babylon, where they were servants to him and to his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. Now listen to verse 21. It tells you why God did it. To fulfill the word of the Lord by the prophet, by the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. That's 70 years. The score is 20 years. So 20, 40, 60, and 10 is 70. We know why the Babylonian captivity was exactly 70 years long and why that was sent as a judgment. Fifth, since the judgment according to Jeremiah was to be exactly 70 prophetic years of 360 days each, and Daniel was studying that exact prophecy of Jeremiah in anticipation of the release of Israel from Babylon, it is obviously and completely appropriate the angel Gabriel reveals to Daniel another period related to Israel that is exactly 490 prophetic years in length, a period of 77s, which is a total of 490 years. Now let's go back where we began our study about the 77s in Daniel 9 and see how it ties to Palm Sunday. Now, for the study of the historical calendars of both Jews, Babylonians, and Romans, I'm indebted to the work of Sir Robert Anderson, who wrote the first definitive work on the dates in the prophecy of Daniel 9. His book is entitled The Coming Prince, if you all want to look it up and read it. It's a big, fat, huge book. I'm giving you like super summaries. <laughs> I'm also indebted to the work of Dr. Alva J. McLean, the founding president of Grace Theological Seminary, in his book Daniel's Prophecy of the Seventy Weeks because they've done all the math related to all the calendars and all the changes in the calendars of all the different nations and the English calendars and everything else. They've worked out the exact and specific dates of the decrees mentioned in Daniel's prophecy, including the exact date on which it took effect and the exact date it ended with the triumphal entry of Christ into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday so long ago. Do you see why this prophecy is important? The following numbers and dates that I'm about to give you are the result of their work. They're not my original work. But let me give you the central parts of that key passage again. Daniel 9, 24. Seventy weeks, or seventy sevens, are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. So seven, sixty, and two weeks is 69. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, which leaves one week yet to be fulfilled. The starting point of the prophecy is the going forth of the commandment to restore and build Jerusalem. Verse 25, note carefully. This is the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem, not the commandment to rebuild the temple. The book of Ezra, and I hope you guys know this, the book of Ezra deals with the rebuilding of the temple. The book of Nehemiah deals with the rebuilding of the city. The command authorizing the rebuilding of the temple and the command authorizing the rebuilding of the city occurred at different times. The Daniel 9 prophecy deals with rebuilding the city. 
Rebuilding the city was a specific request that Nehemiah made to King Artaxerxes in Nehemiah chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, chapter 2, verse 5. And that was the specific request that the king granted to Nehemiah by his decree in Nehemiah 2, 8. Let me read it to you. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hachaliah, and it came to pass in the month Chislu, in the 20th year, as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hanani, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped and were left of captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, the remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. Listen, the wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. So this is what's on Nehemiah's heart when he's going to come into the king. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept. And I mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He's praying, God, help me to know what to do. What can I do about this? What can I do about this? Oh, I wish we would learn how to mourn and fast and pray. What can we do about it? Not just because of the buildings falling apart, but the church falling apart. Sit down, weep, mourn. For days, fast, pray. Chapter 2, verse 1. And it came to pass in the month Nisan, in the twentieth year of Artaxerxes the king, that wine was before him, and I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not been before time sad in his presence. Wherefore the king said unto me, Why is thy countenance sad, seeing thou art not sick? This is nothing else but sorrow of heart. Then I was very sore afraid, because you were never supposed to be unhappy in the presence of the king. That was always supposed to make you really, really super happy. And he could cut off your head if he wanted to. Verse 3. And said unto the king, let, thy, let the king live forever. Why should not my countenance be sad? Now listen to what he's talking about, what he's requesting. When the city, the place of my father's sepulchres, lieth waste, and the gates thereof are consumed with fire. Then the king said unto me, For what dost thou make request? So I prayed to the God of heaven, and I said unto the king, If it please the king, and if thy servant have found favor in thy sight, thou would send me unto Judah, unto the city of my father's sepulchres that I may build it. What's he want to build? The city of his father's sepulchres. What is the city of his father's sepulchres? That I may build Jerusalem. And a letter unto Asaph, this is verse 8, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the palace which appertaineth to the house and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall enter into. And the king granted me according to the good hand of my God upon me. There you have it. He makes the request, the king says yes. There's the decree. I think it's very clear from reading the book of Nehemiah that he rebuilt the wall of the city in 52 days in spite of overwhelming opposition that he faced. So do we know the exact date of the king's decree that we just read in Nehemiah 2.8? Yes. That's what it says in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 1. It came to pass in the month Nisan, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. It was the Jewish month Nisan, so our dating begins with the Jewish calendar. Jewish months are always 30 days long. We just talked about that. Unless a specific day is stated, it's always the first day of the month when the month is mentioned alone. You find that consistently throughout Scripture and throughout writings of the Jews. It also tells us a specific, specific year in the reign of King Artaxerxes, the 20th year. Now listen carefully, because there's really no question on this. Secular historians, as well as sacred historians, are in unanimous agreement that Artaxerxes took the throne in 465 B.C. So 20 years later, remember this is the 20th year of his reign, 20 years later would have been 445 B.C. Remember, B.C. numbers count down backwards, down to the birth of Christ. The first of Nisan in 445 B.C. would have been on our calendars, March 14th, 1445 B.C., according to the current calendar that we're living under right now. It's of intense interest to me, personally, of course, to note that March 14th is also the day that my dear Judy stepped into the heavenly Jerusalem where Christ himself has built the city and the walls. Second, the first 69 sevens of years, that is the first 483 years, are divided in the text of Daniel's prophecy into two divisions composed of a seven sevens period, 49 years, followed by a 62 sevens period, 434 years. Combine that, and we'll talk about what does that first seven end at and so on when we get over into Revelation. Then, after the total 69 periods of sevens, there's one final period of seven. 
In other words, altogether, there's a total of 490 years. So, let's summarize. Here's our definite starting point and ending point for the Daniel 9 prophecy. According to the text, Messiah the Prince would present himself as king 483 years from the going forth of the commandment, which was on March 14, 1445 BC, the going of the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem. After he presented himself as king, doesn't tell you exactly how long, though other passages in the Old Testament do, after he presented himself as king, he would be cut off, killed, a reference to the crucifixion, of course, and the resurrection even is clearly implied here in the Daniel passage, since later in the prophecy, Messiah is the one who destroys the prince that will come. In other words, the Antichrist. On the basis of a 30-day month and a 360-day prophetic year, that's the Jewish year, we can determine the exact date that Jesus presented himself as king to Israel. The exact date of what we would call that first Palm Sunday. Remember Zechariah? 9.9, 9, Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion, shout to daughter of Jerusalem, Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Sir Robert Anderson and Dr. Alva J. McLean have done the math and the calculations against the secular calendars, which have changed at various times over the years. So let me share with you what they discovered. I quote Dr. McLean. In order to find the end of the 69 weeks, we must first reduce them to days. Since we have 69 weeks of seven years each, and each year has 360 days, the equation is as follows. 69 times 7 times 360 equals 173,880 days. Beginning with March 14, 1445 BC, this number of days brings us to April 6, 32 AD. Unquote. Dr. McLean then explains how leap years fit into the scheme and how the addition of an extra month into the Jewish calendar periodically fits into the calculations so that we can arrive at the definitive ending date of the prophecy on April 6, 32 AD, the date that Christ Jesus presented himself as the Messianic King to the Jewish people. It's the only date that Messiah could have presented himself as King and fulfill the Old Testament prophecies. There were lots of messianic expectations moving up this time. There were multiple Jews who declared that they were the Messiah, but they all got it wrong. But Jesus knew when he presented himself that they would reject him. That's why he wept over Jerusalem as he came in view of the city. That's why Luke records what he also said, and when he came near, he beheld the city and wept over it, saying, if thou hadst known, even thou, speaking to Jerusalem, at least in this thy day, specific day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now are they hid from thine eyes. For the days shall come upon thee, that thine enemy shall cast a trench about thee, encompass thee round, and keep thee in on every side, and shall lay thee even with the ground, and thy children within thee, and they shall not leave in thee one stone upon another. Last phrase. Because. Here's the reason. Because. Why are they going to destroy Jerusalem? Because. Why is it going to get laid to the ground? Because. Why are every stone be thrown off the other stones? Because thou knewest not the time of thy visitation. In other words, you are accountable for having known it, and you didn't know it. It was available to you, and you didn't study Scripture, and you didn't know it. That's quite shocking when you think about it. Jesus says they should have known the exact time that he would offer himself as king. Many times in his three-year ministry, he refused to let the crowd come and take him by force and make him king. He rejected it over and over. You read the Gospels. Many times the people wanted to make him king. He said, no, no, now's not my time. Now's not my time. Now's not my time. Because he knew it had to be on a specific date. He rejected their trying to make him king. He always rejected that misplaced enthusiasm because there was an exact time specified in the prophecy of Daniel that he would personally make that offer. If the Jewish people had really studied the scriptures, just as Daniel was studying Jeremiah, they would have known that the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday not only fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9, but it fulfilled to the exact day the prophecy where Messiah the Prince would offer himself as king over Israel. But they didn't know it because they were under judgmental blindness. If thou hadst known, at least in this thy day, the things which belong unto thy peace, but now they are hid from thine eyes. 
Just as the first 70 years that Daniel was studying prophesied by Jeremiah dealt with judgment on Israel for violating the law of God. Even so, this second set of 490 years deals with judgment. And of that period, the last seven years of the worst judgment and suffering that Israel will suffer during the time known as the Great Tribulation. The Lord willing will be studying that seven year period in the context of Daniel's prophecies that relates to the Antichrist in our evening worship when we get to those sections of the book of Revelation. The church age in which we currently live is the valley between the two comings of Christ seen by the Old Testament prophets. That's why sometimes as we've seen both comings are found in the same verse. Since the first 69 week of years, 483 years, will fulfilled exactly, we can expect that the last seven years will be fulfilled exactly from the moment it begins for a period of exactly seven years composed of 12 30-day months, and that's specifically stated in the book of Revelation. The church will not be here on earth at that time since the rapture occurs before it all begins. That final seven years puts us back on Israel's prophetic time clock, because the church is out of here. So we're back to Israel, national Israel once again. Back on Israel's prophetic time clock, as Daniel said, to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision of the prophecy and to anoint the most holy. He's going to be crowned king in Jerusalem. At precisely the end of that prophetic seven-year period, Christ will make his second coming. First coming, offered himself as king, came off the Mount of Olives weeping over Jerusalem from the descent of the Mount of Olives as he looked at, Jer at the Jerusalem. He will make his second coming as king to Jerusalem when his feet touch down where? On the Mount of Olives, exactly where he wept over Jerusalem on the first Palm Sunday. And the second time he comes as the conquering king rather than as the sacrificial king who came to die for our sins. When he touches down, according to scripture, the Mount of Olives will split in two. That's Zechariah chapter 14, verses 3 and 4. And he will enter Jerusalem to set up his millennial kingdom. He's the king, and now he's coming in force, and he will reign to set up the kingdom as promised by both the Old and New Testament prophets. Messiah the Prince came to offer the kingdom to Israel on Palm Sunday. On the precise and exact day prophesied, Messiah the Prince will come again, exactly as promised, and establish his kingdom, and none can stand against him. The promises of God are yea and amen, and none of them can be broken. Even so, come, Lord Jesus, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. Gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for the precision of your word. You're not like the stupid pagan oracles like the oracle of Delphi. You give us with precision, clockwork precision, your acts, and you fulfill your promises with accuracy. And Father, for that, we can know that all the rest of your prophecies are true when we see this one. It stands as a beacon for us all to remember that the word of God is true. And Father, it makes a difference for us because it is Jesus, the Messiah, the one who rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday and then shortly thereafter was crucified and buried and rose the third day. It's in that Jesus in whom we trust for eternal life and he is our King and our Lord. Help us, Father, to serve him, for that is what you do before the great king. You bow, you worship, you serve, you obey. Help us to do it, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.